Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. That's not bad for 10 watts, is it? Today is going to be all rainbows and unicorns in Dave's garage as we begin our RGB LED journey in earnest, lighting our first individually addressable LEDs using the Fast LED Library. As but one example, the audio visualizer and spectrum analyzer you just saw in the intro was built entirely on the foundation we will lay here today. Because once I show you how to control one LED, you can control a dozen. And if you can control a dozen, you can drive a thousand. And if you can drive a thousand of them, well, it does get more complicated after that. But a thousand per pin is plenty of LEDs, trust me. If you need more than that, well, you may just have an LED problem. And speaking of LED problems, here are a few examples of my own obsession. Let's take a quick look at a few previous projects before we learn how they actually work and how you can learn to easily replicate them. This is my ESP32 single chip spectrum analyzer running with a whole bunch of WS2812B strips arranged into a set of grids. Actually, they're grid panels. You can purchase them that way in 16 by 16 grids and I arrange them into 16 by 48. But you can't draw in a 2D matrix until you know how to draw in a 1D strip. So that's where we're going to start today and we'll get here soon. These are my WS2812B Christmas light strips, which stay up all year long, hidden nicely just below the rain gutters on the house. They have a translucent plastic cover which fades in nicely to the white gutter. This was recorded in the summer, so they're running in fireworks mode, but they alternate through about two dozen different effects, all of which are programmable. Everything you see here is built with the exact same strip that's linked to in the description. That also applies to the strips used to build the Tiki Fire Umbrella, which also supports about a dozen effects and adds music reactivity as well. The umbrella has a built-in microphone for music response and doesn't require being paired to anything. One of the first effects we'll work on is this fire effect, shown here in afterburner mode with eight channels in parallel. And if you take this effect and wrap it around your windowsill, well, you can get some rather interesting effects like this one. And when you combine an addressable strip with a fire effect, you get naturally fire windows, which have their own uniquely terrifying look from the inside of the building. By the end of this episode, you'll be ready to start coding your own effects on the exact same hardware. And here's where the magic happens, or depending on how the day is going, the sausage is made. And you can see also a number of my RGB LED effects, ranging from the fire effects to the fireworks to the spectrum analyzers and laser splitters, the fire windows and the animated color schemes. And as we scroll up, you'll get a quick look at the ceiling before we blow out of here and finish up the tour in order to go back and write some code and do some wiring. In our very first episode, we already lit a single LED, but it required three pins to do it. At that rate, lighting a thousand LEDs with a single chip would take. Well, I'm pretty sure it's more than the 20 or so pins we might have access to, so we need a better way. And that better way is found in the standard known as WS2812B. What a name. Imagine a series of LEDs where each LED has its own little microcontroller, because believe it or not, that's exactly what they are. A group of three LEDs, red, green, and blue, and a teeny tiny little microcontroller chip. The LEDs are hooked up in a long serial chain, and whatever comes into the first LED is examined and then passed on to the next LED in the chain and so on down the entire line. I'm not certain, but I would guess they are probably implemented as a shift register of some kind, which is how they pass the square wave data signal along. That also means the signal is dynamic, which is to say, it is recreated each time it is handed from one LED to the next. This is important because it means you aren't trying to push the signal some great distance. As long as you inject power often enough to avoid a voltage drop on the display side, your data will be fine all along the way as well. In my world, there are only three connections. The chip gets power and ground, and it sends signal to the light strip, which also gets power and ground. Those powers could be separate, even at different voltages, like a 5 volt module and a 12 volt strip. Or if both are 5 volts, as in our case, they can just be wired together for simplicity. Here's a look at the wiring diagram to get you up and started so that we can test some code. Alright, let's have a look at WS2812B connections. There's really only three connections, power, ground, and data. Those are in service of three RGB LEDs, a red, a green, and a blue, and an actual little microcontroller that you can see, a little square black thing there. It's built in. This is actually a zoomed in view of one single LED. The data line is connected to the microcontroller and it in turn controls the LEDs. You don't talk to the LEDs directly at any point. All right, here are your four pins on an individual LED. We won't be wiring them up one at a time, but it's good to know how they're actually made. There's a square wave data signal, and it comes in the D in line here, and it goes out the D out 4 line here upon pin 4. You can also see we've got pin 1 and 3, which is power and ground, and that is the entirety of the connections for a single LED. And before we look at our connections, here's just a quick look at the data waveform that actually comes out. You can ignore this if you're not curious, but 
As you can see, the difference between a zero and a one is simply a difference between a short and then a long pulse versus a long and then a short pulse. And if the data line is pulled low for more than 50 microseconds, that's considered a reset and everybody starts over. Don't worry, this won't be on the test. You don't have to remember it. Now, we don't have to worry about any of this for two reasons. The first is that we're going to use fast LED, and the second is that we're using an ESP32, which has special pins that automatically generate square pulse waveforms based on a buffer, so even fast LED has it fairly easy behind the scenes. Well, not easy for the fast LED guys to code, but easy for the chip to do and easy for you to use. All right, here you go. This is it. This is all. Red and black to the module, red and black to the strip, and a data line between the module and the strip. From whatever power input you're using, one red wire runs to the LED strip, one to the module, one black wire to the module, and one to the LED strip. Then this wire, which can be blue or green or whatever color you choose, I suppose, connects the signal line from the five pin on the module to the signal pin on the LED strip. So as much as I would like to simply wave my hands and leave the hardware side to the reader as an exercise, that would hardly be right or helpful. So I'm going to build one while you watch and show you how it's done. Note that I won't be adding any extra capacitors or resistors or gigaws that the electrical engineer types tend to do. They're not wrong, but I found the LEDs to be so tolerant of noise and bad power that I just haven't had any problems that I need to solve with additional circuitry. The strips just work, and so I merely run them with power, ground, signal, and a prayer. Works for me every time. Let's have a look at my mad hardware skills. One of our first tasks is to get power into the circuit, and probably the easiest way to do that is with a female adapter like this that has two little screw terminals. I'll try to post a link to these in the description as well, but if you can't wait a day for Amazon, you could probably make something up with a power brick. Just be safe and don't leave it plugged in unattended. If you can find a module that already has pins in it, you can actually do this in a breadboard without any soldering. However, I figure it's less soldering to do two or three wires than to do 40 pins on the chip, so I'm just going to wire directly to the module. When I'm done, each terminal will have three wires on it. One wire going to the module, one wire going to the light strip, and one wire going to the connector. Now the power wire going to the connector is actually redundant and you would not want it if your strip and your circuit were at different voltages. But since ours are the same, I'm going to wire them together and it's just extra load capacity. With power wired to power on the connector and the strip, that leaves me with just the little red, black, and green wires to go to my module. So let's get the module out and prep it. Best to refer to the circuit diagram, but the shortest way of getting this to work is red to 5 volts, black to ground, and the green to 5, which is the pin we're going to use in our code by saying LED pin equals 5. You might be wondering why we're supplying 5 volts to a 3.3 volt chip, but this module actually has a low dropout regulator on board. The 5 volts from the micro USB port is actually passed directly through to the 5 volt pin, so, well, that's handy because you can actually draw 5 volts off it for your light strip if you're doing a small amount of LEDs. You do have to be very careful because it's a direct pass through to the USB, so we'll find out later what happens if you overload it. For now, I'm going to use this alligator clip attachment for USB cables in order to run it through my meter. It boots up and the internal firmware on the chip starts up, so from here, we'll load our own code onto it. Now I've got to insert the USB cable so I can program it. This would also power it, but it's actually powered by the circuit that it's currently plugged into. And that's simply because we don't want the USB bus powering the LEDs themselves. There's just not enough current available for more than a few LEDs. And speaking of a few LEDs, here's a sneak peek at the rainbow we're going to make today. So if you've got your light strip, your ESP32 module, and a power brick, then you're ready for some RGB action. Or if you still need to order some of those parts, I've made it easy with Amazon links in the description. You can order the exact part numbers I'm using so that you know it'll all work together, and I recommend doing it that way. Today's the day. We're breaking out fast LED and we're going to control some WS2812B individually addressable LEDs in code. Now, as you saw, you have to generate this complex waveform, and that would be really complicated. I've done it once, and didn't go so well. I actually wound up having to start with somebody else's library, steal some code from somebody else. Well, I didn't steal it. I borrowed it. Downloaded it off GitHub. I, I saw him walking down the street, so I kicked his wooden leg out from underneath him and then I grabbed the binder of code that he was carrying, and in it I found the code that I needed. Something like that. So to make this all work, and to make it bearable, we're going to use a library called FastLED. And FastLED is going to handle all of our color management. It handles the basic CRGB class, which represents any LED or pixel. It has just three things, R, G, and B. It is a 24-bit color value. It has no other attributes. You can do lots of stuff with it, but it has no other state. 
So what we're going to do is take an array of those. If we have 100 LEDs, we'll have an array of 100 CRGB objects. And we hand that off to Fast LED and say, please display this like it's a frame buffer of LED data, which it kind of is. And it does so. It's magic that way. So it's not a complex library, but it's quite a powerful and a really well-written and an elegant library. It's small and tight and was written for Atmel chips that run at 8 megahertz. We're at 240 megahertz, so we're at 30 times the clock rate and four times the bit width, so we should be a little faster. Some of the original code is actually in hand-coded assembly, but we won't see any of that because it's all on the Atmel side and all the ESP32 stuff is pure C or C++. Speaking of which, today we're going to introduce a modicum of C++ because FastLED uses it. You can probably tell my beard looks a little darker because I've been using C++ this week getting ready for the episode. It's even stubblier, I think. Yeah. Oh, speaking of sound, that's my new microphone. I have been trying to improve the audio because the audio on some of the initial episodes, when I was worried about, you know, bokeh and all the other visual stuff, I was just using the built-in preamps in the camera and they're a little noisy and hissy and it wasn't the best. I had some noise in the shop and beeps going on and fans in the background. So I've tried to cure all of that that I can to get you some quality audio. I won't be doing the ASMR thing, but it'll at least be tolerable. So right now I've got the microphone visible in the frame in the corner and I'm not sure if I'm going to keep that. You can let me know. Do I need the big headphones and do the whole PewDiePie thing or, uh, yeah. Right now it's actually a good placement for audio is why it's there. And then I realized it's in frame and I'm like, well, a lot of people do that. So I think I'll leave it for one episode and see how it looks. What do you think? So back to fast LED and how amazing it is. I don't want to bum you out, but Dan Garcia, the guy who wrote fast LED, unfortunately passed away late last year. If you remember, there was a dive boat fire off the coast of California where 34 people perished. Dan and his partner were among the victims. Though I didn't know him and I'd never even exchanged an email with him, it still bums me out occasionally. The Fast LED library was quite obviously a labor of love to Dan, so I think if anything, our best tribute is to build some cool stuff using code he wrote. So let's do that. All right, let's take a look at our starting C file. This is where we left off last week. And basically, I've stripped it back to where it initializes the OLED display. It calculates the frames per second. How many frames per second can it draw the frames per second? It's like Inception, but less interesting and easier to understand. So let me give you a quick walk through this code. The Arduino header is required in pretty much every Arduino project. UHG 2 lib is for drawing graphics and text on our OLED display. We define the pins that our display is connected to, and we define a constructor for a single global object which uses those pins and our desired rotation to create an OLED object that we can draw to. We're going to ask it its line height and save that in this global variable so we don't have to ask it repeatedly. Frames per second is just a handy utility function that returns a reciprocal of the time you specify. So if you tell it one third of a second, that's three frames per second, as it says here. It also does it as a weighted average, keeping 90% of the old value and taking 10% of the new value on each frame. So it takes somewhere around 10 frames maybe to start giving you a nominally accurate value. The setup function, which as you know is called only one time, sets the pin mode on the built-in LED to output so that we can toggle it off and on in each frame. And it initializes a serial port for later debugging. All we ever actually do with it at this point is print ESP32 startup to it at the beginning, but eventually it will be more helpful. The OLED itself, we start it up, we clear the display, we set the font, and we ask it its line height. Within the loop, which is called repeatedly, but we actually hold context and never return, we keep track of the LED state, the number of frames per second that we last saw, which starts out at zero, and we toggle whatever the LED state it happened to just be, and then we write it out to the LED. We record the starting time, and then we do our OLED display of FPS and the value. This fanciness ends after the percent sign. It's dot zero means I want no digits after the decimal point. Why don't I? I'm going to do one decimal. Damn it, I feel like a rebel today. I don't know why. Oh, because the original implementation in our last version was integer, that's why. <laughs> but now I'm keeping track of it as a double. So, and that's it. We should be able to build and run this and see what we get. You've seen enough of them by now that unless something interesting happens, I'm going to skip the builds as if they're instant. All right, that's our starting point. Just a little display that says 29 frames a second because that's how fast it can draw. Now, let's talk about fast LED and how we bring that into our project. This is where some of the initial investment you might have made in installing platform I.O. rather than just the Arduino IDE, this is where it starts to pay off. Because rather than having to go to GitHub or download a library through a library manager or some more complicated system, 
All we have to do is add it to our list of library dependencies and it will be downloaded and magically installed for us. Now, I already know that it's called FastLED and that's a pretty good safe guess, but we'll search for FastLED and make sure it's in fact called that. Dan Garcia, there you go, 60,000 downloads. So to pick up this library, all we need to do is go back to our files, go into our platform.io.any file and add FastLED. Back in main, we're now going to include the header file for it. I'm going to pound define one variable. Just from previous experience. I'm pretty sure they mean symbol. If you define FastLED internal, it will suppress the banner that FastLED feels compelled to print every time it compiles. I like my compiles to be as quiet as possible, so. No need in running this because it doesn't do anything different, but I'm going to compile it to make sure it compiles, which it does. Great. So off the top of my head, all the steps you need for fast LED to get it up and running are to include the library, include the header file, define which pin your LEDs are hooked up to, indicate how many LEDs you have, call an add LEDs function to add them to fast LED, and then call show. And that's about it. Let's have a look. This is my way of saying that I don't want to later have to mem set this all to zero. So I'm just going to say, please make it all zeros. Works for me. So in the setup, just like we set the pin direction for the built-in LED, we're going to set the pin direction for the external LEDs. Even though they're handled completely differently, they're still each driven off a pin. Fast LED supports something like a dozen different LED types. And so this is where we specify what type of LED we're using and where it's connected and how many there are. So that's what we're going to be passing. You'll notice the GRB, and that can vary by manufacturer of LED strip. The ones that I use expect the data in GRB format, meaning when you give it the 24 bits, it expects the G to be the first eight bits and the R to be the next eight bits and the B to be the last eight bits. Normally you would think RGB, why they didn't standardize and agree, but they didn't. So you're allowed to support either. And so the code has to support either, but it really comes down to as simple as a definition. I've only run into one thing that was not GRB, by the way, so that seems to be at least the most common. So if you're following along and ordering from my description using the links in there, then you're going to be getting GRB stuff because it's the same parts I'm using. I'm passing 16 here. You may pass more, however. So let's say you set the brightness all to 255 and then you set them all to white. Well, you're going to let the smoke out of somewhere unless you've got a big power supply, so don't do that. But for fun, you can set this wherever you want in terms of brightness, as long as you trust your code not to turn on too many white LEDs at the same time. Normally, if you're not here, oh, 255 all the time. Oh yeah, that's how we roll. The CRGB class contains definitions for a number of named colors, which makes it handy to for calling the constructor with something that's a little more readable. Actually, I'm going to move this down to the loop and make it part of our super drawing code. That's it, that's all. Add LEDs, set brightness, and show. Unless I'm forgetting something, but let's see. Let's see what we get. I think I've made it like four episodes without a compiler error yet. <laughs> I had a sense. What have I done? Ah, yes, LEDs. It's G, LEDs. We'll try that one more time. That warning is for an unused variable inside FastLED. I'm just gonna put up with it because I don't want to disable warnings. I probably could disable them around FastLED, but just gonna put up with it for this time being. Hey, look, I read LED and no significant change in performance because we went from 29 to 28 frames per second. Let's make a simple loop and set them all. So we're under half a watt. So if I went from red to white, should only be 1.5 watts, right? Three times as bright because I'd be using three LEDs 
instead of just the red. I'm scared, but we're gonna try it. I may have to unplug it rapidly. <laughs> And there are better ways to do this that I will show you later. I just don't want to complicate the discussion with maximum wattages and stuff that we'll do calculations for later. Let's just turn it white and see what happens. See if it stays white or fades out. All right, because the brightness is so low, it's going to be able to survive it. If I crank the brightness up to 255, um, no, it would not. 20 milliamps per leg per LED, so 60 per LED. 1200 Come on, do it. strip 1.2 amps should be able to do it let me check my math with a calculator come on just try it so my contention is 20 milliamps times three colors times 20 leds is 1200 1.2 amps how much can you ask on the usb bus why is he being such an old lady 0.5 yeah so it would not be able to supply it so i'm not going to try it check in all right it's only my computer that's a good point by the way if you're doing this, you should probably be hooking it up through a small hub or switch, I should say. Please don't plug your project into the top port of your $57,000 Mac Pro, even though you could. Don't. All right, 255. There we go. Now it's angry. That's what I was afraid of. So that's what you don't want to have happen. Now, now what do I do? Can't reprogram it. Every time I plug it in, it's gonna do that. Uh huh. So I have to unplug my LEDs. So, as you may have to at some point, I've unplugged my LEDs to prevent the overload from causing me complications when I boot the chip up to flash it. There we go. Brightness back at 16. Now, we don't need a loop because there are helper functions. So, let's learn some of the helper functions by using them now. You can see there's a number of fills here that you can use. We're going to fill the LEDs. I'm going to fill them all. And let's do it with green. There we go. Green LEDs, just like the doctor ordered. The next interesting function is fill rainbow, which, as you probably have guessed, fills the LEDs with a rainbow. So the two things you need to specify are the starting color and then the rate at which you step through the color wheel as you fill the next LEDs. This is where we pass an initial hue, which we haven't declared yet, but we shall. And a delta hue. There are 255 positions on the color wheel, and so 16 will step us through at a reasonable rate. Hue density is the rate at which we advance the initial hue. So each time we come into this frame, we're going to increment the initial color so that the color scrolls. And this is how fast. To make that work, we simply add it in right there. Well, that seems close. Let's see what we get. There you go. We made a rainbow, and we color walked it, and we're powering everything, including the chip, all with under half a watt. I hope you found today's episode some combination of interesting and informative. If you did, I encourage you to let me know by liking and subscribing. And most importantly, turning on the bell notification so that we find out when the next episode comes out. Otherwise, this is such a small channel that you'll never likely stumble across it again. So please do take a moment to subscribe now if you haven't already. I've also heard rumors that there are some broken thumbs up buttons on YouTube. If yours are gray, you may want to click on mine right now to see if it turns blue for you. If it does, that's good. Stop. Just leave it blue. Join the blue crew. Join me next time as we continue to work step by step towards building the Tube of Mystery. And this $13 baby is only your first stop on the RGB train. Get yours now in the description. And I confess, it's true. I'm living large on the fat, fat commissions from your plastic infinity mirrors on my Amazon affiliate links. Coming up next on Dave's Garage, which G-Wagon do I look the best in? No, actually, we'll be developing the flame effect you see over my shoulders. I'll even give you the public domain code for free, because that's just the kind of guy I am. Until then, thanks for watching, and as always, have a good night. Join the Blue Crew. Well, hello everybody. My name is Carl. C-A-R-L, Carl. I'm the cameraman. Good night everybody. Don't forget to subscribe.